Good afternoon, my dear friends. I am really excited to be here with you today. Our guest uh, speaker today is Dr. Roland McCready. He is a, a, the director of research of the HeartMath Research Center at the HeartMath Institute. And as a psychophysiology physiologist, Dr. McCready's research interests include the physiology of emotion, heart-brain communication, and the global interconnectivity between people and the Earth's energetic systems. I'm really excited to welcome Dr. McCready with us today. Hi, Dr. Hi there. Hey, Hi. great to be here. It's good to see you. I've been looking forward to this for weeks, and I apologize for having to cancel, but uh, had an emotional um uh, upset with the passing of my sweet little dog. So she's in the background over here, right behind my shoulder. So she's been an integral part of my life and all of our patients know her because she's always coming to the office. But anyway, I'm just thrilled to have you. And, you know, a lot of people don't know anything about heart math. Uh, so we want to be able to help them understand a little bit about the work you do. Can you Give us uh, a little background about how you got started in this amazing work. Well, the short answer to that, there's a long story, a middle story, and a short story. But the, the shortest one I can say is it's really through personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my original training background was electrical engineering, communication engineering. I used to work for Motorola and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We got interested in uh, some of the deeper aspects of electromagnetism and what they really are and, and so on, which led me to to uh california actually uh back in the 1970s mm. and i uh, got a degree in consciousness studies because i wasn't quite satisfied with what i was learning there and and uh basically you know that got me into the study of consciousness and actually got a degree in consciousness studies in one of the first schools that had accredited degrees in that type of thing back in, in the 70s and got into meditation and that kind of took me down that path and you know went through, I want, I don't remember all the names of it now back in that era, but, uh, you know, yeah. and, but I was, you know, probably not very good at it, but sincere about my practices and, and, um, got a lot of, I can say a lot of benefit out of that, that era. And then I, um, through a, I actually started another company cause I got into humanitarian stuff and that didn't really go where I would thought it would. And, uh, but pretty successful company. And, and, uh, then I, I met uh, Doc Childry, who's the founder of, of HeartMath, and mm -hmm. started practicing some of uh, what he was talking about that he had been doing in his own personal research for, for many years, mm -hmm. which had to do with, you know, the heart and the heart, what we call heart intelligence. And I took it kind of seriously, you know, I had an experience uh, in working with him over a few days and, and uh, that kind of uh, an awakening experience of my own, what my own heart was about. And I can honestly tell you that I made more personal growth and practices in, in multiple dimensions of, of being in three months than I had probably in 15 years of my meditative practices. So, so that got my attention. Yeah, I and, bet. And I started, you know, using some of the. This is long before heart math was heart math. You know, where mm -hmm. these uh, tools and techniques have been kind of developed like we have now. And then I started bringing some of those ideas and principles in and teaching my employees. You know, about half my time, it seemed back then, was sorting out employee tensions and issues and had a lot of employees in a pretty successful company mm -hmm. and it was helping them too you know, even though it wasn't as formalized so that uh, led me to follow my own inner intuitive guidance i could say and, and uh, sold that company for a lot less than it was actually worth so i could help uh, join with some others who actually came with me from my company and uh, help doc Childry uh, uh, launch and found heart math so that, yeah. that's the short version so yeah, I know. I've known about heart math since I was in seminary, really, at uh, Unity. And, yeah, um, you know, we've actually uh, used heart math some in our practice, but then we got, you know, diverted to something else. But I really wanted to bring this idea back to people because, you know, I was watching some of the videos on, on your uh, website, and within uh, two minutes, I'm already calmed down feeling better. Uh, it's been kind of a crazy week, you know, Sure. and um, upset about Ukraine and all that, but mm -hmm. it's amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about what is heart rate variability or just talk about the whole science behind it? 
<laughs> okay. Um, Everything, you know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, heart rate variability. Let me start, um, Dr. B, by saying, you know, most, uh, about everybody knows what heart rate is, I assume. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really how many times does the heart beat in a minute. You know, that's why everybody's got their stethoscopes and, you know, doctors and measuring the pulse and counting. But in reality, our heart rate changes with every heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So the so heart rate variability is measuring those beat to beat changes. So what we do is we measure the time interval between each consecutive pair of heartbeats. And that you see when you look, that's always varying. Mm -hmm. Now, if so, the heart isn't a metronome like was actually believed you know, a long time ago. Uh, you know that was even thought to be a sign of good health. Uh, you know, it was a steady heart rhythm. And it, it's so wrong. I mean, it's amazing how wrong we really were in, in uh, science and medicine about that. So the, this beat to beat change is called heart rate variability. That's the variability in heart rate, beat to beat. Mm -hmm. And that's important for a lot of reasons, this variability. Uh, as I said, in a healthy person, we have a lot of it in this natural variability. In fact, the amount of this natural beat to beat variability or, or HRV as we call it for short, um, is directly related to aging. We have more of it when we're young and it has almost a linear relationship or a linear decline in how much variability we have to age. Hmm. In hmm. fact, we can measure if somebody's on a healthy trajectory, right? You know, they're not overly stressed and burned out and you know, we're having some type of a chronic disease. Uh, we can tell within about two years how old they are just by looking at their heart rate oh, variability. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, so it's one of our best uh, measures of, of aging. First mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. now where it uh, is important in medicine, you know, or clinical type work is that if the amount of variability we have for our age, we always have to always understand I'll take age into consideration from now on. I don't keep saying it. Uh, so we have to know what somebody's age is. We're going to say how much of it do they have and is that normal or not? But if it's lower than it should be, that is a strong risk factor for future serious health problems mm -hmm. and it, it's it's okay. uh, um, not it's not quite the same level of risk factor it's way more it's what i'm really saying here but not, and if you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol and these types of things okay right? yeah. i didn't know that. that's interesting yeah, yeah so so that's how it's, it's used in risk assessment a lot okay. the is, is one level of, of heart rate variability now the main reasons uh, and we do analysis for clinics all over the world as part of our, our research program. And I say the main reason for lower variability than we should have is stress. Long-term accumulated stress. It's not, it's not that I had a bad day or a bad week. It's like months of mm -hmm. accumulated stress, which I think a lot of the world lives in now these days. Right. So, you know, it's like you're starting a new company, you know, and you're burning the candle at both ends, not getting the proper sleep and recovery. But we're doing that day after day after day for weeks and months. Um, or we have a, a, a large trauma that hits us, you know, that really takes a lot out. That can also reduce it um, as well. But, but but the most common is long term stress. Yeah. And then the, the second uh, biggest reason is, is some type of chronic disease, uh, usually those that have inflammatory uh, issues with them like diabetes and you know heart failure you know heart mm -hmm. disease and, and so on so inflammatory type uh, diseases especially will, will reduce the hrv um, and in fact it's interesting that well may, maybe interesting is the wrong word but um, it's lower hrv has been shown that the hrv will drop off you know faster than the slope should from the age related uh, in some cases two years or more before the onset of symptoms Really? Oh, that's yeah, so sensitive. Wow. Yeah. So it's a good okay. early warning indicator. So that's the kind of the clinical reason that it's used. In, and HRV is exploding out there. There's all these apps now and stuff for measuring your HRV and, and things. Uh -huh. But the that's I want to go another level, though. Okay. Our, our work um, started looking at HRV back in the early 90s. Uh, actually, before it was called heart rate variability, we we're, were kind of some of the first to really uh, dig into it. At a, at a much deeper level. And we were looking at a psychophysiology lab, uh, not so much risk prediction, although that had been already been established. Uh, we were looking at it in the context of emotions. 
Mm. Uh, what what HRV really reflects, if we look over the shorter time, not you know how much of it we have over a day, which is your the way you do it clinically, uh, but what happens when we're feeling different emotions, and uh, which is showing us changes in what the activity that's occurring in our nervous system is really what HRV reflects in that that context. And what we found, um, and, and back, we were measuring all sorts of things back then, you know, brain waves and skin conductance and you know all the little three three little acronyms that we use for you know EEGs and ECGs and GSRs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what uh, became pretty quickly apparent was that when people are feeling things like anxiety or frustration or impatience that the heart rhythm is, uh, and by the way, HRV is really what underlies the heart rhythm, you know, so, so if the time between each pair of heartbeats was always the same, it'd be a flat, it'd be a flat line and we'd have no heart rhythm. Right. Mm -hmm. But in, in healthy people that anyway, the rhythm became very chaotic looking. Yeah. And we later ended up calling that in an incoherent rhythm. But what was even a more amazing is when people were, were feeling, and I emphasize that word feeling because thinking it doesn't work doesn't do it uh feelings of gratitude or appreciation or kindness or compassion or love the heart rhythm became what we now call a coherent rhythm it was a it wasn't just an, a, a shuttle shift it was like our body and physiology was literally shifting into a very different state that was being reflected in the, the rhythm of the heart um which we call it that's what we call heart coherence now or a coherent heart rhythm and so that's kind of started a, a very long journey of really understanding, well, what does this mean? What is What has to be going on in our brain or nervous system uh, for that pattern to emerge? And that, that's a very long story, but it's a, we, 400 and some studies later, you know, independent studies pretty well, I think, verify that it's an optimal state that when we can shift into this coherent state, the heart, the lungs, the body in general is doing less work and getting more done. So it's a highly energy efficient state. Um, so that was kind of a neat uh, part of that process. But, yeah, it, it's like harmony. That's yeah, that well, 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 exactly. And that's why we use the word coherence. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Cause in science, coherence is a, a term that's used to describe the behavior of the parts of a complex system. You know, it certainly is any living system. It certainly is human beings. We're extremely complex systems. Yeah. And so coherence in a, to have coherence means that the parts of the system have to somehow be talking to each other, mm -hmm. right? There has to be communication for them to work together in a harmonious way. Right. That, uh, and another, uh, in coherence, there's a lot of things embedded in that term, like mm -hmm. the, the output or that is greater than the sum of the parts, right? The wholeness is always greater than the sum of the parts in a coherent system. And it also implies energy efficiency within the system. Yeah. So that's why we chose that term to describe the state that we, we had um, run across. Okay, so people can learn through some kind of feedback or uh, mechanism to change their heart rate variability and get into a state of coherence more often. And do you, how would you do that? Use that clinically? Like, you know, let's say I've got a patient with mm -hmm. extreme anxiety mm -hmm. and they've got a lot of uh, uh, stressors in their life mm -hmm. and they just right. aren't dealing with it. Can you say a little bit about how we yeah. use that? Well, sh well, sure. The, so what, well, let me, um, give you a, a slightly longer answer than, than a soundbite here, because I think that would help. When, once we really understood coherence and incoherence and what that meant in terms of the physiology and inside of our bodies, we then developed a series of what I would now call self-regulation techniques mm -hmm. that allow us to make the shift from incoherence to coherence almost any time, any place. This is something you can do with your eyes open when you're in a meeting, when you're in a traffic jam, um, that, because it's a natural state, coherence and incoherence. We go through it in and out all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, mostly, uh, all, maybe not so much all the time these days because there's so much stress. It's very rare that we might actually be feeling things like gratitude and kindness and, and appreciation. But that's mm -hmm. what naturally takes us in, into that, that state. So uh, there's about eight now, uh, what I would say, core heart math techniques that all lead to a shift to, to, in, to coherence. 
And then we developed a little bit later on in, the, in our um, trajectory there, uh, technology that'll let you see in real time what your heart rate variability looks like, the pattern of it. Mm-hmm. So now when we talk about coherence and incoherence, this doesn't have anything to do with how much of it we have. And that was an important part of the development of, of the devices to feed this back because you can be an old fart like me, right? And I'm going to have a lot lower amount of HRV than my son who's, you know, way younger than I am, right? So the coherence is the pattern of the rhythm, not so much the amplitude of it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and that's important to, well, maybe not important for all the listeners, but but anyway, we developed the devices and algorithms that you can put a little clip on your ear. Um, in fact, I've got one laying over here somewhere. Um, this is a, a wired version. A little clip that you clip on your ear, right? And it plugs mm-hmm. in your phone. And there's also a Bluetooth version. That measures your heart rate variability in real time and feeds back. You can actually see the pattern of it. So when you get that feedback while you're practicing the self-regulation skills, you start to to develop the uh, relationship between what the techniques are using, how you feel inside, and the rhythm. So it's a powerful way to to, um, facilitate learning the skills, you know, and getting that feedback. Am I, you know, coherent or not? So if people practice and learn to go quit more more quickly into coherence when you know life stresses you out mm-hmm. would that change like with the person like us that are getting a little bit older would would it improve our our coherence our well, our heart rate variability well, well yeah cuz it's uh, yes <laughs> this is the quick answer uh if we if we you know we we practice this cuz one of the things that Probably two things I need to, to say here is that I think a lot of people find this helpful to understand is that we say when we talk about stress, mm-hmm. right? You're stressing me out or, you know, I'm in traffic and I was all stressed. Well, what if we look a little bit under the hood of what that word means in terms of physiology, psychophysiology, stress is always an emotion. Yeah, it is. It, it's not the thing out there. It's not the traffic jam or the difficult person you're having to deal with. Um, it's our internal response and how we feel about it. Yeah. Right. So it used to be that uh, this changed a little bit in, in recent years, but the number one stress or the thing out there that caused us to feel frustration and all these things uh, used to be time pressure. You know, and, but you actually look at the questions and how it's defined. It's actually literally the feeling that we never have enough time. Yeah. Right. So even in, in those questions, it's always the emotion. So it's it's really the impatience we feel, the frustration, the anxiety, the feelings of overwhelm. That is what makes up what we call stress. Yeah. And, and that's important because it's the emotions that run the show in our body. It's not our thoughts. I mean, yeah, they have a, a, a relationship. But it's emotions that drive the activity in our hormonal system and our nervous system, and, you know, which then impact the immune system and, and on it goes. Yeah. So learning to really manage, you know, our, our stress reactions, those feelings of frustration and patience and so on uh, is really key if we're going to have healthy aging. Right. And uh, yeah, someone once said that stress is probably the number one killer. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, the American Institute of Stress, who, uh, Paul Ra- Dr. Paul Roche, who was uh, one of my mentors, actually, for many years, he, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, um, did work. And we often quote him by saying that uh, 90% of visits to your doctor, to a primary care physician, are stress-related. Yeah. So 90% of the reasons that we go to a doctor are yeah, I, yeah, I see that all the time. No matter what their chief complaint is. You, if you pull back and keep unraveling what's behind it is something stress yeah. or, or people, some people would just say I'm worried about, but that, right. yeah. that stress. Yeah, exactly. You know, what, one of the things that always fascinated me and I, I just posted a little graphic on, on the, on the Facebook group of how far out the energy goes mm. from our body, from our heart. Can mm. you, Speak a little bit. Sure, about sure. That. No, before I do, I just want to add one other okay. thing is, it, to what I was just talking about. Okay. And that is that, you know, the heart and brain are, are interconnected more so through the nervous system than any other systems in our body. Yeah. 
And the heart actually sends more information through the nervous system neurologically to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. Yeah, interesting. All right, so I think most of our listeners can, we, we know this intuitively. Yeah. I mean, very few people that I, I know would, would say to, you know, to their uh, spouse or their boyfriend or girlfriend, I love you with all my head, right? It's always, I love you with all my heart, right? So, yeah, right. Uh, so the brain is largely interpreting the signal sent from the heart. I mean, those signals go directly to the amygdalas and, and it have a lot to do with informing how we feel. So learning how to shift the rhythms of the heart is the shortcut for starting to reduce things like depression and anxiety and worry. And, and those signals to the heart profoundly affect brain function in terms of our capacity to make good decisions. So if we're able to shift into coherence, we always want to do that before making an important decision because that enhances brain function. I just wanted to add that. And that's a key to being able to manage stress, make yeah. better choices. And, you know, it's amazing. Uh, I've, I've been uh, working through a, a program about learning how to get into zone mm -hmm. more often, mm -hmm. which it, I can't remember if I, they were talking about uh, heart coherence or not, but uh, when you, can you say something about that? When, you know, when we are in that state of a better coherence, then mm -hmm. we are able to uh, think better. Our creative ideas come forth yeah. more easily. Yep. We think better, we're able to focus, and, and we're more emotionally stable, mm -hmm. right? We're not getting so significant about everything, you know? So it's, it's really a stability and a clarity that comes in. Um, yeah. So it could be helpful for people with anxiety and depression. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And e even kids, I was just yeah. thinking. Uh, yeah. Even you know, preschool we, kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they're they uh, teaching kids how to meditate, but it, it's a way to get into that yeah. quiet inner space. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. So to answer your other question about the energy field. So, so when we put uh, electrodes across the chest to measure the electrocardiogram, you know, or we stick electrodes on the head to measure the EEG or the brain waves. What's being measured there is the flow of current electricity. That's why it's okay. called the electrocardiogram or the electroencephalograph. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you've probably done that many, many thousands of times in your practice, right? Yeah, we do EEGs here, and it, yeah. it'd be interesting. We do, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, what, what's being measured is current flow. That's my key yeah. thing across mm -hmm. the electrodes. But we know. I mean, this is physics 101 whenever you have a flow of current, you create a magnetic field, mm -hmm. right? So this is, uh, now we don't tend to think of that. Most people don't, but that's what's going on. And magnetic and electric fields are very different animals. Now we, you can't measure the magnetic component with the electrodes. Mm -hmm. That takes a different device and that's called a magnetometer, okay. which measures magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the qualities of magnetic fields is they go through things. This is why our cell phones work indoors, right? So we're, uh, in fact, this is a great analogy, actually, the cell phone in today's world, uh, because we know they work indoors and we're using electromagnetic fields to carry information, right? Our voice, mm -hmm. picture, the text mm -hmm. message, that we're carrying that from our phone to the cell tower and uh, it, right indoors, it can even be in an elevator in our cell phones work. So just like that in the, the human body, the current flow creates the magnetic field, easily radiates right through the skin and out into the space around us. Right? Yeah. So we can measure the magnetic field if you keep backing the sensor up, you know, to a few number of feet away from the body. You can measure a brainwave about an inch away with the same equipment. Hmm. So, so clearly the heart's the big player if we're talking energetically, you know, and I mean magnetically in, in this magnetic, literal magnetic fields. So I'm not talking necessarily about an aura here, you know, which I can't yet measure uh, directly like it can magnetic fields. And, you know, and this is not uh, some big new discovery. I mean, hosp most teaching hospitals especially have devices called MCGs, magnetocardiograms, mm. that measure this routinely. So you, you don't have to put electrodes on the body. You can measure the field out in space, either the brain or, or the heart. So what uh, we did, especially because my past in electrical engineering and communication engineering, in fact, using almost the, the same identical techniques I would have used back in my Motorola days to decode or demodulate the signal, right, that a radio was sending, I, we applied that to the signals of the magnetic fields of the heart. And lo and behold, 
uh, you could easily see that different information was being carried on the field that dire directly related back to how we were feeling. So in other words, our emotions, what we're feeling, don't stop at the skin. We are literally broadcasting them and the information that we can now measure out here in space. And, and again, this is probably not a surprise for any of the listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, we, people intuitively know this, right? Um, I'm sure you know what I what I mean, uh, Doctor. Yeah, Reed. yeah. I mean, uh, there have been time, there have been times when I've come close to someone who is really centered, and you just feel good. You know, yeah. you, it's a calming energy. Right. And then, or to be around somebody who is uh, upset, or mm -hmm. in it, the energy is chaotic, and it doesn't feel good, and you want to kind of pull back yeah. and not be too close. So. Our, I used to have a doctor friend and every time I would be talking to him, uh, he was never looking at me, but his energy was so chaotic that it almost hurt. You know, yeah. it's like, so you had, but I love that picture of how far out the energy field goes from our body so that we become a radiating, beautiful flow yeah. of energy that can be healing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the key here is that we're always broadcasting. Yeah. Right. And it, it's, it's, uh, I like what you said, though, because it's really about us. We take more self-responsibility for our emotional diet. One of the ways we can put it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are. And this really helps. I've, I've found for a lot of people, once they really grok what we're talking about, it actually helps motivate them to become more responsible for what, as we say around here, what we're feeding the field. Yeah. Right? Right. Are we feeding our, our field, you know, vibrations. And I, I don't mean new age here. I'm talking literal. If we can measure these frequencies and vibrations were radiating of frustration and anxiety and, you know, in extreme cases, hate and anger, you know, or are, are we, you know, sending feelings of kindness, you know, the frequencies of that and gratitude and appreciation and compassion uh, because it, it matters. See that my exactly. second statement here is what we feed the field matters because mm -hmm. it has measurable effects and it's all published, right. Uh, for yeah. in scientific journals, uh, we can, our nervous systems, we're not only broadcasting, but we're also receiving yeah. mm -hmm. and detecting those signals from others. And they have measurable effects. You know, even, even though we're not necessarily conscious of it. Yeah. That's why some people will wear you out and you don't want to be around them. Um, it reminds me of the energy, you know, Dr. Emoto, the Japanese. Mm, sure. A uh, fellow who did all those cr uh, water crystals uh, yeah. with messages from water, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, just feeling right. hate uh, or whatever, or, or yeah. feeling love or appreciation changes the water crystals. It's yeah. amazing. I, you know, that's yeah. even how homeopathy works. I, yeah. I'm also a homeopath. I don't oh, do too much enough. anymore, but it's the energy, the vibration of the original substance right. that remains in the water that right. can then have a healing effect yeah. on on the mind, body, spirit sort of thing. But uh, are you doing anything? Well, I wanted you to talk a little bit about this uh, March 18th through 20th event that mm -hmm. HeartMath is sponsoring called the Rise of Collective Compassion. And we'll put a link to that uh, in the comments too. Oh, great. Thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So this is a, an, a, an annual event that we've been doing. This is our eighth year uh, for what's um, called the Global uh, Coherence Initiative. Yeah. And the Global Coherence Initiative is really where we've been looking at and studying the interconnectivity between us and the Earth's energetic system or the Earth's magnetic systems. And um, actually, we've published quite a few papers from that research in the last last few years. And um, so this, this is a really neat event. It's my favorite event uh, that we we do. And we used to do them in person, uh, actually in Tulum, Mexico. Uh, of course, with the COVID and the pandemic and all, we've had to go online. So this will be our second year doing, doing them online. But they're still really neat events. And we've got uh, a lot of neat speakers, featured speakers this year that are joining us. Uh, Celia Ellsworthy, uh, Scylla, I should say, I'm sorry for mispronouncing her name there, uh, who's been nominated for three Nobel Peace Prizes. Uh, and so she's going to be one of our featured speakers. Lovely, lovely woman. And yeah. got a lot of really, I think, important uh, wisdom. And you, you, you would love her. Uh, I hope you, you come to it. In fact, Dr. B, I think you'd really enjoy seeing her, yeah. especially. Uh, 
I'm planning on it. So that'll be great. Oh, that's great, great. And, it uh, is online, so yeah, people don't online. have to travel. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, Roger Nelson, the founder of the Global Consciousness Project, mm. uh, one of our one of my staff, research staff, and uh, Nakam uh, Palitha, is going to be speaking as well on on the uh, Global Consciousness Project, which is a global, a big scientific instrument that Rogers, Dr. Nelson's been running for twenty years, mm-hmm. and we're now becoming the new home for that and evolving that into its next generation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the citizen scientist project and then i'll also be doing a presentation on our new project for trees for global tree monitoring and trees uh, oh yeah, really measuring the electrical activity of trees globally and then i'll be explaining why we're doing that and, and how people can get involved and then dr joe dispenza is a featured speaker mm-hmm. on the second day and uh um debbie rosman howard martin from heart math will be doing a lot of very practical skills uh so this is this is a program even if you've studied heart math before that's new um uh, oh, really bringing in uh well i always try and bring something new to this in the latest research and then uh, uh dr james miles will be a, a featured speaker on the third day who's really uh, uh be sharing about his work of bringing compassion right down to the street uh, of his work in uh, inner city um uh, projects in chicago uh, you know, some of the challenges and successes of, of how we really uh, bring this to the street. And, uh, yeah, so. I, I've always been very interested in this whole idea. Back Going back in my early days as a, as a pediatrician, I knew something was missing, you know. Um, and I got uh, interested in the Institute of Noetic Sciences yeah, sure. and, you know, all kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we get so caught up in the little nitty gritty things of life that we forget to come home to ourselves. Okay. And I believe that this kind of work can have a huge impact on our world. Okay. And I I think if every one of us would take the initiative to get ourselves back into a place of uh, heartfelt love and compassion for uh, each other, even even just your family or your friends, but that just goes out to spread around the whole world. And, and maybe we can help heal some of the terrible things that are going on right now. You know, I've been deeply impacted by what's going on in Ukraine. Of course, it makes us angry. We want to scream and yell, but we also need to just go into that quiet place within. And if ever, if more and more people do that, then we will have a resonance that will impact those kind of situations. Do you want to say any more about that? Okay. Well, you're, you're really speaking to the heart of what the Global uh, Coherence Initiative is all about, Dr. Mm-hmm. B. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe connect one more dot here then for our listeners. I know we don't have time to really go into all the science of this, but the let me start this by saying that to help kind of make a visual picture. Uh, back when we were in, uh, I don't know, middle eight, middle school, something somewhere in there in science class mm-hmm. I was growing up. We got to dump iron filings on the glass plate. Remember that? Yeah. You put a magnet under it, you know, and yeah. you kind of have fun and, you know, yeah. uh, drag it around it, so that the iron filings not show you the shape of the field, whatever your magnet is, whether it's a ball or a bar or whatever, a horseshoe and so on. But the, the thing I wanted to re- remind people of is those iron filings lined up in, in lines next to each other. It wasn't just you know, homogeneous right. black blob, right? Mm-hmm. So not only are we seeing the shape of the field, we're actually seeing, we're able to visualize what are called magnetic field lines. Mm-hmm. Now, that's important for what I, where I'm going because we have the magnetic field of Earth, which is, by the way, really important. Without that, there would be no water, air, or nothing left on Earth to turn into Mars because that, it's our prote- what protects us. But those magnetic field lines, you know, South Pole, North Pole, they, go, they are really long. Well, here's the thing that we, at least I didn't learn back in grade school uh, or whenever that was, is you can pluck magnetic field lines and they vibrate just like a guitar string. Okay. Well, plucking the strings of earth, the magnetic, and these are actually called field line resonances is the scientific term. Uh-huh. It's plucking the strings of earth, the magnetic fields, is the solar wind rushing by, right? And the earth is turning in that and the strings are vibrating, the magnetic field lines. 
Yeah, the in frequency language, this blew me away once we really uncovered this. And we have a global magnetometer system of magnetometers all around the Earth, specifically to measure the Earth's mm -hmm. field mm -hmm. frequencies in them. Now, is the frequency of the Earth's magnetic fields is 0 0.1 hertz in frequency language. Uh -huh. That means one cycle every 10 seconds, the 0.1 hertz. Yeah. It's exactly the same frequency as the human heart rhythm when we're in a coherent state. Oh, gosh. Mm. Right? So through resonant coupling, to, as we, I won't have time to go into all the demos here, but when two systems vibrate at the same frequency, we transfer energy and information between them. Yeah. Right? So just like we were talking about how our personal field is carrying information that can be detected by others, the fact that our hearts and brains have another set of magnetic frequencies are vibrating at the same frequency as the rhythms of Earth means that we can transfer energy and information between those systems. So not only are we broadcasting in our local field environment, we are coupled, I'm suggesting we are coupled with and really uh, putting those frequencies, those vibrations into the larger field environment. And we're all doing that together. Yeah, and when we get on the same intention, yeah. then we can make a huge difference in the world. You know, I, I watched a, a Netflix documentary on fungi. It's called uh, sure. Fantastic Fungi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, a, have you seen that? I don't know if I've seen that one, but. Uh, Amazing yeah. how they're, they are just the yeah. network that supports life yeah. and how trees help yeah. each other and communicate right. with one another. You know, there's just so much. Yeah. good things in our life that if we just learn to um, say yes to it, yeah. you know, not only we, are we going to be healthier, live longer so that we can do more good in the mm -hmm. world, but we're going to make an impact on everybody else around us and the planet itself. So yeah. now I, there is a Tom, could you put that link that I gave you about how people can watch some of the videos on the website it's called experience.heartmath.com. Isn't that it? Something like that. Yeah, or .org. You can go to .org too, the nonprofit. Okay. Her, okay, Tom can put that in on there. I yeah, think Tom. Fact, yeah. In fact, uh, the uh, URL I see on the screen here now, you have oh, www.heartmath.com. That there actually you. would be .org. .org. Okay. Yeah. Tom, change it. Okay. Yeah, .org.com, I got a little mixed up myself. That's okay. There's there's two uh, two there's two heartmaths.org, which is the research and education uh, schools and the parents and uh, who I'm with. The, the, I'm the research director, but then there's also .com that is more of the commercial side of things. So the the event, the the, the rise of the collective compassion is a, a .org event. Okay. So, there you go. Okay. Well, there's so much on the website. Yeah. I I just had to it's really had, fine it, it happens all the time and uh way i had to stop watching the video so that i could talk to you in person uh -huh. so anyway this has been so wonderful i wish we could go on and on and on and i do hope that i know a lot of people are maybe still at work but that you watch this later because i tomorrow i'm going to have open office hours and we're going to talk a little bit more about this and about how do we learn to deal with the stressors in our life. So thank you so much. I appreciate it with all my heart. Okay. You bet. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say to our beloved people? Well, it would just be kind of the follow up to pause throughout the day whenever you can and, and ask yourself, what am I feeding the field? Mm -hmm. It matters. It, if it, not, it profoundly affects our own health and happiness, but it's also affecting others. Absolutely. And, yes. And I'll be talking more about that and be yeah. sure that folks begin to get it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. B. You have right. a great rest of your day.